Thank you, Richard. Is my mic being mic'd? I can ignore these. You hear me okay? Yeah, good. So I was told that Mohandas Gandhi spoke in this hall some time ago, and I wonder if this is where he said when he was asked, what do you think of Western civilization? His answer was, it would be a good idea. <laughs> and I think action for happiness is a step in that direction. So um, let me start with a story which I think I may have told before, but it's worth repeating. It's uh, actually a very well-known experiment in psychology called the Good Samaritan Study. It was done with divinity students who were told they were going to give a practice sermon and be evaluated on it. Half of them were given as their text the parable of the Good Samaritan, the man who stopped to help the stranger in need by the side of the road. The other half were given random Bible topics. They each have a few minutes to prepare, and then one by one they go to another building to give the sermon and be evaluated. And as they went over to the building, crossing a courtyard, they pass a man who's bent over in pain and moaning. And the question is, do they stop to help the stranger in need? What do you think? Does it matter if you're thinking about the parable of the Good Samaritan? You'd assume so, right? No, it didn't matter. <laughs> what made the big difference was uh, how much time they felt they had. If you thought you were late, there was no way you were going to stop and help the stranger in need. And in a sense, that's the story of our lives in the modern world. Uh, there's a spectrum that runs from self-absorption, my to-do list, my, the thing I'm late for, what's on my mind, to noticing there's another person present, to paying attention to that person, to tuning in, to empathizing, to sensing is that person in need, and then can I help, and then acting. And whether we go down that road is, I think, one of the most compelling questions, particularly for action for happiness. Do we act to help? Because there are people everywhere that can be helped in various ways, and the opportunities for each of us are, are quite large. But we have our lives, so how do we balance those things? Let me also consider how mindfulness plays a role in this. Uh, are, are, you, are people in action for happiness doing mindfulness generally? Richard, I'm asking. Yeah. So, as Richard mentioned, I just finished a book. It's going to be called The Science of Meditation here in the UK. You can order it online, although it won't come out till September. And we reviewed systematically the more than 6,000 studies that have been published in peer review articles uh, on meditation. And we boiled them down to the 60 most compelling studies. And the most studied method of all kinds of meditation, it turns out, is mindfulness. And the results are quite encouraging. But first, I have to confess to having spread some neuromythology, starting in that book, Destructive Emotions. You may have heard that mindfulness shifts the brain from the sector of negative emotions to positive emotions. Anybody ever hear about that study? Oh, good. Very few. It turns out it's not necessarily true. And one of the things we were doing in the book is kind of cutting through the hype. Uh, it turns out I just was at a, a business uh, summit this morning. And many, many people are selling mindfulness to uh, business. God bless you, Alex. This is my caffeine. <laughs> Jet lag. So, the, um, where was I? Yeah, business, okay. So, business uh, is being sold mindfulness, and it's being sold mindfulness on the basis of studies that aren't that sound. So, let me tell you what's really sound. First of all, the one very clear finding on mindfulness that does stand up has to do with what's called an amygdala hijack. An amygdala hijack occurs when something triggers us, and there are three signs. We have a very strong emotional response, uh, something like very angry or very anxious or panicked. It's very quick, very sudden, 
And the third sign is that after the dust settles, we wish we hadn't done what we did. Why did I say that? Why did I do it? I'm sure it never happens here. You're all in action for happiness, right? So amygdala hijacks. The amygdala is the brain's radar for threat. Right now, our amygdala is asking us, am I safe? And if the answer is no, then it triggers a hijack of the prefrontal area. The prefrontal area is the part of the brain that is mindful, that uh, comprehends, that analyzes, that makes good decisions, that learns. And if we're hijacked, the prefrontal cortex is paralyzed. It, and it's taken over by the amygdala, which just wants to do whatever we need to do to survive. Is anybody here old enough to remember when television had something called static? That, that, that's what the amygdala sees, it's a static picture of what's going on. And because it's... <laughs> role in evolution has been to help us survive, it would rather be safe than sorry. So it errs on the side of, we better respond now just to be safe. And it's responding today to symbolic realities, not biological threats. So we get you know, in a situation where, say, we think we're being treated unfairly, and it triggers a hijack. And when we're hijacked, our attention, we become mindless. Our attention fixates on what we think is the threat. That's all we can think about. And another thing that happens is that our memory hierarchy changes so that only what's relevant to the threat is what we can remember most easily. So let me give you a piece of advice. If you are in the midst of a really heated argument with your spouse or partner or loved one, those are two amygdala hijacks happening at the same time. It is very hard because of this memory shift to answer the question, at that moment, why am I with this person? <laughs> so just wait 20 minutes, give your amygdala time to cool down, and you'll remember, oh yeah, right, I love this person, okay. So in amygdala hijack, we act in ways that we wish we had. One of the strongest findings on mindfulness is that the amygdala becomes less reactive. And the more you do mindfulness, the uh, less reactive it becomes. It doesn't mean it's out of commission, but it isn't hijacking us so much anymore. And mindfulness, uh, when it's combined with, say, cognitive therapy, mindfulness, MBCT as it's called, is very powerful because it, let, it, gives, it shifts our relationship to our thoughts and our feelings. And we can let those triggering thoughts come and go instead of taking us over. So I think that's one of the, the powers. Anybody here familiar with MBCT? Yeah, it's, it's a very, very powerful method. A second um, finding is that, and this should be no surprise, mindfulness enhances our attentional abilities. This is really important today because people are more distracted than ever in human history. And the reason is, uh, let me ask, how many people have a smartphone with them? Exactly, that's the problem. <laughs> because they are very seductive devices. All of our, not all of our, but they're full of really juicy distractions, our smartphones. There's Facebook, there's Instagram, there's whatever it is that you like to watch. So a, a very smart cognitive scientist, Herbert Simon, who I think won a Nobel, made an observation a long time ago. He says, what information consumes is attention. A wealth of information means a poverty of attention. Today, we get, on average, five times more information in a day than was true 20 years ago. We're inundated with the flow of information. Not only that, there was an article 10 years ago in Time Magazine, the big magazine in America, when there were magazines in America. And it's, it had a little squib that said, there's a new word in the English language. The word is pizzled. It's a combination of puzzled and pissed off. And it, it means, it, it uh, refers to that moment when you're walking down the street with someone and they pull out their Blackberry and start talking to someone else. You know that this is dated because they said Blackberry. Nobody has a Blackberry. <laughs> but the point is that the ground rules, the norms for attention both individually and interpersonally, have shifted silently and inexorably. You go to a romantic restaurant with tablecloths and candlelight, and a couple is sitting face to face, 
and they're not looking at each other's eyes, they're both looking at their phones. This is what's happened in modern life. My, one of my granddaughters was at our house and five family members happened to be looking at screens simultaneously and she said, so, how's everyone doing? It was like a radical idea, we could talk to each other. But that's how things have shifted. So mindfulness has become more important because it, it strengthens what's called cognitive control. Cognitive control is the ability to pay attention to the task at hand and ignore distractions. It's how we get work done. It's how we engage with one another. And it's more important than ever that we have a way to strengthen the muscle of the mind that's called attention. The, there's a mental gym, and mindfulness is a workout in that gym. In the mental gym, you focus on one thing, say your breath, and your mind wanders. And then you notice it wandered, that's the moment of mindfulness, and you bring it back. That is the identical action in terms of your mental brain circuitry as going to a gym and lifting a weight. Every time you lift the weight and do a repetition, you strengthen the muscle a bit. And the same with bringing your mind back. Uh, my view is that, that the real action in mindfulness is noticing when your mind wandered. Did anybody have their mind wander during mindfulness? Of course. They did a, a study at Harvard. They gave people an app for their phones, and it rang them at random times day and night, and it asked two questions. What are you doing now, and what are you thinking about? The gap between them, uh, those two things, of course, is whether you're paying attention now, you're mindful, or not. 50% of the time, our minds are wandering. They're wandering 90% when we're commuting, when we're in front of a video monitor, and when we're at work. I don't know about you, but those other people at work. <laughs> so it wanders least 10% of the time, according to this data, uh, when, during romantic moments. But uh, who would answer an app like that during a... <laughs> I, I, I doubt that data. But anyway, so the mind is wired to wand wander. The article title is, A Wandering Mind is an Unhappy Mind. Because it turns out that where the mind tends to wander is what's bothering us, particularly in our relationships. So we tend to think about, you know, why didn't she invite me to the party? Why didn't he answer my email? Why did they say this to me? The things that are troubling us are on our mind. So mindfulness is a, a real move toward mental health in the sense that you have more freedom of choice in what you think about. So that's another factor in mindfulness. And cognitive control itself is extremely important. I don't know if you know the marshmallow test. It's a famous study in psychology. They did it at Stanford with four-year-olds from the preschool. They brought them to a room. They sat them down at a little table put a big juicy marshmallow on the table, and they said to the child, you can have this now if you want, but if you don't eat it till I come back from an errand, you can have two then. And then the experimenter leaves the room and that poor child is <laughs> stranded there with a marshmallow. And about a third of them grab it on the spot, they just can't stand it, and about a third wait the endless seven or eight minutes and they get two. The payoff for this finding comes 14 years later when the kids are tracked down, and it turns out that the kids who grabbed, compared to the kids who waited, uh, don't get along as well with their friends, still can't delay gratification in pursuit of their goals, that's what a direct test, and on the uh, college admission exam of 1,600 total points, the kids who waited had a 210 point advantage, it's a huge difference. So cognitive control is really important, there was a study done in New Zealand, where they tracked kids from four to eight, they measured cognitive control. They did it with a marshmallow test, several other converging measures. Tracked them down at 32. The strongest predictor of good health and financial success was cognitive control in childhood. It was not your IQ, and it was not the wealth of the family you grew up in. This is something that is independent of those very powerful effects. I was uh, in Manhattan visiting a school 
where in a very impoverished area, it's called Spanish Harlem. And the kids there, seven and eight year olds, had something they did every day. It was called belly buddies. They'd go to their cubby and get their favorite stuffed animal and find a place to lie down on a rug and put the animal on their belly and watch it rise on the in-breath, fall on the out-breath. One, two, three on the in-breath, one, two, three on the out-breath. That is an age-appropriate lesson in mindfulness. And in that school, those kids, half of whom had what are called special needs, you know, learning disabilities, hyperactivity, autism, so on. I thought the class would be totally chaotic. It was very calm, and the kids were very focused. And the teacher said, it's because of belly buddies. So mindfulness is this kind of mindfulness, I argue, is something we should be teaching all children. It should be part of the school curriculum. In fact, when you do teach it, kids can learn better. They behave better. It should be part of what's called social emotional learning, which is not only looking at uh, you know, emotional lines of development and social lines of development, but attention is also a part of a child's development. And the child's brain doesn't mature anatomically until the mid-20s. During that time, right now, we leave emotional, social, and attentional abilities to random chance. Why don't we teach every child this basic skill, mindfulness? So if you do, you get better cognitive control, and that predicts a happier life, a healthier life, and uh, better wealth. Another finding, working memory. This is interesting. Working memory, from a cognitive science point of view, is your ability to pay attention to what's happening now long enough that it transfers to long-term memory so you can remember it later. It's the essence of learning. So it turns out that mindfulness increases your working memory. They did this at the uh, University of California and it turned out the students in the study who had mindfulness training did better on the graduate school entrance exam. Why? Because they're able to, to learn better. Finally, there's multitasking. I don't know. I won't ask if you're a multitasker. We all try. But, you know, multitasking is actually a myth. The brain does not do things in parallel. It switches rapidly. And it turns out if you're really into something, like you're working on this report or you're doing this mathematical problem, and then you decide to take that email or to go online or to do a text or whatever, and then you come back to it, you've diminished the power of concentration for the original task. It takes time to build up. Except if you have a mindfulness session. Ten minutes of mindfulness reverses the debilitating effect of multitasking on concentration. So those, those, that's the good news on attention. But the best news actually comes with empathy and compassion. There are three kinds of empathy. There is cognitive empathy. I understand how you see the world, how you think about things. Uh, that kind of empathy lets you be a very good communicator because you know the terms to use so someone will understand. A second kind of empathy is emotional empathy. I feel what you feel. I feel with you. And the third kind of empathy is technically called empathic concern. It's caring about the person. I not only know what you're thinking and what you're feeling, but I want to help you if I can. That's the basis of compassion. There's very good work uh, being done now by Tanya Singer over at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. She finds that each of these kinds of empathy is based in different circuitry in the brain. The concern, the caring, is based on the same circuits that are activated in a parent's love for a child. They're the mammalian caretaking circuits, very basic. And the first two, think about it, the first two kinds of em empathy, cognitive, I know how you think, emotional, I know how you feel, put those together, it could be called marketing, <laughs> isn't it? What makes the difference, what gives us an ethical rudder is the third, the compassion, the caring. So it turns out the brain is really happy and ready to get more caring. And the uh, way to do it is 
often paired with what we just did, the mindfulness. It's called loving kindness practice. And I'm going to uh, take you through it because I think we all should do it. It's very appropriate for action, for happiness. So if you would sit up in a dignified position. And I recommend you close your eyes or just let your gaze go uh, kind of neutral. And bring to mind someone in your life who has been very kind to you. You feel very grateful for their presence in your life. And just feel the, the love and gratitude toward that person. And wish them well, that they be safe, happy, healthy, free from suffering. That they have a life of f fulfillment and happiness. And then think of yourself in the same way and wish for yourself that you be safe, happy, healthy, free from suffering, that you have a fulfilled life. And now bring to mind the people you care about most, your loved ones. And make those same wishes for them, that they be safe and happy, healthy, free from suffering. That they live fulfilled lives. And now, make those same wishes for everybody in this city, everyone throughout London, throughout Great Britain, throughout Europe, throughout the world. Extend the wish to everyone everywhere that they be safe, happy, healthy, free from suffering, that their lives be fulfilling. And you can open your eyes. So that's a simple method. And it turns out to be a psychoactive technique. It strengthens the circuitry for caring and compassion. The Dalai Lama, who oh, I wrote the book for, The Force for Good, it was for his 80th birthday, actually, says, has a program, it's a vision. Here's what he would love people to do. This is the best present you can give me, he says. And by the way, if you want to know more about it, there's a website called Join a Force for Good. And the four is the number four, Join a Force for Good. But he says there's basically three steps. The first is to compose yourself. Be mindful or MBCT, whatever helps you be calm and clear. The second is adopt an attitude of compassion. It's an ethical outlook. It's a predisposition to help. And then the third is to act now in whatever way you can. And he, he has a map. He says there are four or five areas where action is really needed. He, I'll tell you what they are. They're not the only ways to help, but I find them very, very helpful. The first, he said, is... We know we really need transparency. The world is full of corruption and collusion. He lives in, a, in Asia. And a lot of Asian countries, the, the graph, they call it bakshis, is explicit. It's a cultural norm. There are other countries, like, say, my country, I don't know about your country, where there is a lot of collusion at the highest level. We have a president who's trying to make give big tax breaks to the richest people. He happens to be one of them. That's a kind of collusive act. So the Dalai Lama says this is very dangerous for the world. It erodes trust. 
and it's just not fair. And whatever you can do to expose it, he says there's dirty business, dirty politics, dirty science, dirty religion. They all need to be cleaned up. And they need three things, transparency and accountability. So, you know, I think of the Catholic Church and all the sex abuse that went on, or all the private schools, the fancy private schools where it's just coming out. There was no transparency and no accountability. Now there's transparency. Next step is make people responsible for their actions. And by the way, he's a big fan of the Pope, the Dalai Lama, because the new Pope, he says, is the, finally, he says, we have a Christian Pope. We have someone who's, <laughs> <laughs> so, because he's, he's doing all of these things. The second is economics. He said, you know, the growing gap between rich and poor around the world is a moral crime. The system we have, and Richard is one of those economists who's trying to find a new way around it, the system we have just does not work because it favors owners and handicaps workers. Owners share of the pie gets bigger and bigger faster than workers and workers share. Do I have this right, Richard, more or less? Is that right? Worker share is shrinking? Yeah. Yeah. I just want to check. You. He's an expert. Yeah. And um, he says not only do we need to reinvent the economy, but we need businesses that operate for the good, not just for profit. And I, I was talking to him about a, a bakery in New York that was started by a Zen teacher whose Zendo was in a very poor neighborhood in an area called the Bronx. And he wondered what they, they could do to help people in the neighborhood. And they realized that the neighborhood was full of, you know, single moms on welfare and, you know, ex-felons who couldn't get any job of any kind. So they decided to start a bakery. And um, do they have Ben & Jerry's ice cream in this country? If you've ever eaten Ben & Jerry's chocolate fudge brownie flavor, which I recommend, the brownies in that ice cream come from the Greystone Bakery in the Bronx. The, this bakery supplies, they send two truckloads of brownies up to Vermont every day. The motto of the Greystone Bakery is, we don't hire people to bake brownies, we bake brownies to hire people. It's a new business model. It's, sometimes it's called a B corporation, which means in the very charter of the company, it's not just for stockholders' interests, like ordinary corporations. It also has a mission, an environmental or social or compassionate mission. And the shareholders want to see that mission fulfilled as much as they want to make money. So it gives a dual uh, responsibility to the people operating the company. And then there's, you know, many corporations um, have what's called corporate social responsibility. I like the one that surprised me is Unilever. I'll tell you a story about Unilever. It's a big company here, right? Unilever was founded by a guy who was a son of a bitch. He was a robber baron uh, who was known uh, and hated throughout the Netherlands and Belgium because in the late 19th century, this, uh, I have to tell you, it was his own grandniece who told me this. I met her. Uh, she said everybody hated him because he claimed he had a patent on margarine, which was like a big new discovery in the late 19th century. And he put everyone else who was a competitor out of business. And he ended up owning all those companies. He unified all the margin makers in Benelux uh, through strong arming, basically. He had a company called Uni, U-N-I-E in French. And he realized that the main ingredient in margarine at the time was palm oil, and that he could have an economy of scale if he would combine with a soap maker. And there was a lever in Britain making soap. So they joined forces that invented Unilever. Fast forward several decades. That was the foundation of Unilever. A friend of mine is coach to the one of the co-CEOs of Unilever, at the time they bought Ben & Jerry's. Did you know that? Unilever owns Ben & Jerry's. Why did they buy Ben & Jerry's? Because they wanted 
the idealistic DNA of Ben and Jerry's to infect Unilever. That was the strategy. That was the hope. Now, Richard and I were a couple of years back at, at, at Davos, the World Economic Forum. Another guy who was there was Paul Pullman, who's the CEO of Unilever. He announced there that they had a number of corporate goals. One of them was not only a drastic reduction in carbon footprint, another was to incorporate a half million small farms in the third world into their supply chain. That's, that is big because it meant they had to help those farmers upgrade their operations so that they could be dependable suppliers, which means that those farms which had boom and bust cycles would have steady income. The World Bank says the best way to help the education and health of an economy, of a local community in the rural third world is exactly that, steady jobs. So what they're doing is a social good. It also probably is good for their flexibility in, in supply chain. So it's dual role. There's a company in California called Salesforce. It's a big marketing company. Has a very idealistic CEO. He has what he calls one, one, one. One percent of profit, one percent of people's time, one percent of product to charity. And he's gotten a lot of other big tech companies to do the same. So there are many, many ways for companies big and small to, to be models. And the Dalai Lama applauds all of that. A third, and this is one that I think is probably done a lot here in, in this community, the Action for Happiness community. It's helping out people in need, and whatever that need may be. But the Dalai Lama says something interesting. He says uh, something that other people are saying too, which is the best way to help people in need is to help them help themselves, if you can, if you can find a way. You know, teach a skill or whatever. Grayson Bakery is a good model. Another one uh, is the us and them thinking, which is created divides around the world and is always a cause of, of war. What we did is a big challenge. When we went from compassion and wishing well people we love toward neutral people, other people in London, and people everywhere, that also includes some very unpleasant people. It may include people across that divide, whatever divides we personally may have. But he says that is the key step that if we had the sense of oneness of humanity, we wouldn't have these troubles between groups. He, he really lives it. I've seen this. He pays no attention to uh, you know, status, rank, income. He doesn't care about any of that. He, uh, someone who, who's traveled with him for a long time said, back when Gorbachev was in the Kremlin, he was, went to the Kremlin to visit him. He's going up the steps to the Kremlin. Apparently, there are a lot of steps in front of the Kremlin. And there's a guy standing there with the Kalashnikov, like the guards at Buckingham Palace, you know, not moving. And the Dalai Lama sees him and goes over and shakes his hand very warmly. And the guard said, later, 25 years of standing here, no one has noticed me. <laughs> but that's, that's the Dalai Lama. He sees everyone really the same and treats them that way. Then there's the environment. The environment is a really interesting one because uh, the Dalai Lama says if you're really going to understand and help you need to analyze the system that's created the problem and come up with a systemic fix if you really want to be effective and the problem with the environment is this the global warming which is a byproduct of our everyday activity these lights, everything that we wear, that we use, the chairs, the stage, has what's called an embodied footprint. What that embodied footprint is, is the cumulative impact on the eight global systems that support life on the planet. Carbon is just one. Water is another. Potable water is uh, going to be a desperate thing, probably more before, way before the climate crisis. Anyway, we all inadvertently are part of a very large system which is slowly destroying the ability of our planet to support life. So once you understand that, then you see that, you know, this is what's called the Anthropocene age. You know, this is the part of my talk that's really like a little depressing. So just bear with me. It gets more uplifting later. So anyway, 
So the Anthropocene age is the first uh, geological age where one species, us, is impacting the entire world geologically and uh, meteorologically and so on. The problem is that our brain was designed during the Pleistocene, during a different age, where, as I said, the amygdala, which is the, uh, the sentinel, the radar for safety, evolved. And so our sentry system evolved during the same period. And our sentry system, it turns out, is oblivious to the impacts of what we do. The changes are too small, too micro, or too macro for us to see, hear, sense in any way. So we're oblivious to the harm we do. Not only that, our amygdala, our whole survival threat system, is wired for another range of threat. You know, it's the, the saber-toothed tiger, the car that's about to hit us. It's not climate warming. In fact, our survival system in the brain kind of shrugs. So we need a different, we need a workaround. We need to think systemically. One of the th proposals is that we have radical transparency. Radical transparency would take this glass and say, this is not a product, this is a process. It starts with sand that's gathered and chemicals that are made and mixed together and then it's all heated at a very high temperature for a very long time. By the way, a Bronze Age technology we still use for glass, steel, concrete and bricks. It's one of the worst causes of climate warming, but hey, you know, worked before. So they break it down. There's a new uh, discipline. It's called industrial ecology. They have something called life cycle assessment. They break this glass down into almost 2,000 separate steps. At each step, they can analyze impacts in air, water, soil, carbon, so on. In other words, there is now a way, a methodology, for understanding at a very fine-grained level the impacts of all of this. If you recycle your yogurt carton, right? If you have yogurt in a little carton, do you have it in glass or a plastic carton? Plastic. Plastic carton. Okay. So you can feel good by recycling your yogurt carton. Do you know how much of the carbon impact you remediate by recycling your plastic yogurt cup? 5%. In other words, we are oblivious to the other 95%, which is mostly cows. Cows produce a lot of methane, which is even worse than carbon. And they do it because industrial farming gives them a kind of feed that their stomach is not used to. But it helps make a lot of yogurt very quickly. The other point is that whenever the earth is being degraded, pretty much someone is making money somewhere. So hand in hand with rethinking economics is rethinking environmental impacts. It, the bottom line is we not only need to reinvent systems, I think we need radical transparency about impacts because we as consumers could make very different decisions. And if we create a market force that favors the better way of doing things, then companies will start to shift. But also, we, can, we need to reinvent everything. I don't know if anyone here has any entrepreneurial interest, but everything in the material world is made in a way that harms the planet because we didn't know what the impacts were. We never thought about it in those days. There were two students at a technical school in the States reinvented styrofoam. Styrofoam is one of the worst things for the Earth. It never disintegrates, ever. It's petroleum. It doesn't mix with water. So they reinvented styrofoam by coming up with something that works the same but is made out of rice hulls, natural byproduct of milling rice, and mushroom roots. Wow. It's called Ecovation is the company. And this is fantastic. This is a model of products for the future. So. These are kind of high level, you might think, ways of changing things, but there are a thousand ways each of us can act in any of these realms. And the Dalai Lama says it does not matter what specifically we do, what matters is that we act now. I love that this is called action for happiness. He says, you have to stay optimistic too. He says, uh, he met the Queen Mother, Queen Elizabeth's mother, when she turned 100. 
And he said to her, you've lived a century. Do you think things are getting better or getting worse? And she instantly said, oh, they're getting better. And what she meant was that when she was young, the world was a very different place. You know, look at women's rights. The, the change over the century is stunning. Look at the fact, and as an American, I'm very grateful for this, that this country, which once was a huge colonial power, has virtually no colonies anymore. They're independent nations. She saw that as progress. If you look at the newspaper, I'm a reformed journalist. I used to be at the New York Times. If you look at the newspaper, the headlines are designed for the amygdala. You want to know what the danger is, what the threat is, and you want to be prepared implicitly. So that's what, cap that's what sells newspapers. But if you were to take all of the acts of oppression, hostility, and hatred on the one hand, and all the acts of goodness on the other, people making lunch for their kids, or you know, just civility, kindness in every form, the acts of kindness far outweigh the acts of negativity and hostility every day of the year. It's just not, it's just not news. We take it for granted. So the fact is that we can all be agents in a force for good. It's up to each of us to find the particular way that we can act. Thank you. Dan, thank you so much. Um, we've got time before we sort of act on this call to action, which we do want to very specifically do, to take some questions. So um, there's some microphones coming around the audience. If you'd like to raise your hand to give us a show of where there may be some interesting questions, either on mindfulness and the science or on how we put this idea into practice for a, a happier world. I'm going to cheat and abuse my position slightly, Dan, by asking you the first question, which is yeah. one of the things about meditation that often I hear as a criticism is this idea of there are so many things going wrong in the world. How is sitting still and being calm and not doing anything going to possibly help with that? Now, of course, you've already shown to some extent why that is a sort of yeah. flawed hypothesis. But so, you, you see quite a lot this idea that how will sitting there effectively doing nothing help change the problems we see around so us? So, first of all, you're not doing nothing. And second of all, do you exercise? Yes. Why? Because of physical health and, and mood boosting. It looks like a waste of time to me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Same thing. <laughs> it's a mental gym. It's a mental gym. Yeah, yeah. So, um, let's see, where, 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 there's, a, there's a gentleman here with his hand up. Anyone else raising their hand at this stage? And there's one over there with Jade. Okay, let's start here. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gorman. Um, I, know, I, I liked your loving kindness approach to everybody, but I was a little concerned that it was limited to the consciousness of human beings. There are a lot of conscious beings on this world, particularly domesticated animals, that we don't seem to care very much about at all. And I'm a little bit worried about this focus on people, that we could ignore that. So my request to you is, can you extend this approach to consider all conscious beings on the earth rather than just human beings? Yeah, that's actually the real way to do this. That it ends with may all beings everywhere be safe, happy, healthy. I ended it with people. Uh, I don't know you all very well, and I didn't know how you'd react if I said beings. Now I know. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> Thank you. Lovely question, lovely answer. Jade, you've got one over here, I think. Yeah. Thank you for such an inspirational and um, an optimistic talk. Um, I especially enjoyed your focus on the environment uh, with which you talk a good game. So my question to you is, what's your take on veganism? What was the word? Veganism, being a vegan. Oh, veganism. I think I, I applaud veganism. Do I need to say more? <laughs> uh, I, I think, it, I, and I take your point very well. We, you know, one of the... Uh, kind of blinders we have, apart from the impacts on the planet of, every, of what we buy, use, and so on, and what we do, uh, is a kind of speciesist approach. We value humans, we don't value animals. And there's uh, Matthew Ricard spoke here before, right? Mm. Uh, Matthew Ricard? Yeah. 
So Matthew has just written a wonderful book, which is an argument for vegetarianism, where he really depicts in graphic detail the reality of industrial farming. And you could extend that to all farming. Uh, we don't really need animal protein these days to survive. Uh, maybe we did in the wild. Maybe we did when our brain was designed. But things are different now. And in terms of compassion, uh, I think it, it should extend beyond the cats and dogs and horses we love to every sentient being. I, however, have a ways to go. I've given up red meat. I'm still not so good on fish, I'm afraid. Uh, and my granddaughter is a uh, vegetarian, not a vegan. There you have it. Thank you. Um, so let's identify a couple more. So, Guy, there's one next to you here, and then we'll come and take this one in the front row, and then we'll take some from further up. Hi. Um, I work in, um, in a big corporation, I guess, and I wanted to know if you have seen any good ways on introducing mindfulness in, in, in corporations. I've seen it sometimes done before at the company, but it doesn't seem to be something that then people continue uh, to do in their lives. Uh, you mean it was introduced to the company? It was, yeah, yeah. And it just, I guess the way it was done, it just didn't mm -hmm. really work. Yeah. So the culture really needs to support mindfulness for it to stick. That means high-level people need to talk about its value, uh, affirm it. I once went to... Um, a company where everyone spends hours at a video monitor, hunched over and typing, and they have two meditation rooms. And I was told that if you were seen using those rooms too much, you'd be fired. <laughs> so you have to really understand that the culture, uh, I'm, I'm working on an initiative to try to help companies change culture to support that kind of activity for well-being, but we have a long way to go. However, as I was telling Richard at dinner, 20 years ago when I wrote a book called Emotional Intelligence, they said you cannot use the word emotion in business. And now like it's like a hot you know, leadership thing, emotional intelligence. Cultures change. Cultures change. Thank you. Let's come down here. Um, <clears throat> it seems like uh, we live in a world which uh, computer algorithms are increasingly playing an important part in the search results that <clears throat> come up and your Facebook friends, etc., etc. One of the things I've been thinking about recently is in what way could you inject compassion into those algorithms? Ah. I don't know if you've got any wisdom to share on that. Yes, it's interesting that we assume those algorithms have no compassion. I think that's right. It's, but the problem is not in the algorithm. The problem is the people who create the algorithms. Because what they're doing is modeling their value system implicitly in the algorithms. So I think the answer is to have more compassionate systems. I was just working with the uh, school systems called the International Baccalaureate Schools. They're kind of global, they're very high standard. And they're introducing a curriculum in compassionate systems. I didn't mention it, but the last area the Dalai Lama really encourages people to think about is education. Helping kids learn these values, learn these skills early in life, including compassion. So they'll go through life making decisions and acting in ways which create a better world. And I think that's a place to start. Google is another place. But. Dan, I was really struck when you, you talked about this us, us and them culture, yeah. which I think has been so um, prominent recently in, for example, the, the, the dialogue around the UK's decision to leave the European Union or perhaps some of the rationale behind voting in Trump and so on, this idea of fear of the other. Yes, right. And the mindfulness and compassion gets away from that. I think the Facebook and online algorithms thing is very interesting because, of course, we're now increasingly seeing our own bubble view. So we're not seeing the viewpoints of others. and we're exactly. not. So I, I wonder if this mindful compassion is a way of being able to step outside and see the other's perspective in a way that helps. Well, yeah, compassion more. begins with empathy, with understanding the other's perspective. Yeah. I, I have a... A nephew who does international water mediation and this means he goes around the world to places like Central Asia or the Middle East where countries share a river system but hate each other or at war <coughs> and in order to survive they need to manage that water system cooperatively so he starts the meeting people come in the room with the attitude us and them and we want ours and he starts not by asking people what their position is but what's the spiritual meaning of water in your culture? 
Right? In other words, it's, he starts with an, a commonality, with an emotional valence everyone shares, and then works from there. And I think that's an interesting model for us and them uh, yeah. thinking. Because we go back to our common humanity. Thank you. Yes. I promise to take a question from higher up. So the gentleman in the blue jacket had his arm up, and then we'll go up to behind you, Jade, up there with the lady with her hand up. I wonder if you could say anything about the, um, what the research has shown is the limitations of mindfulness. And by that, I mean maybe some of the assumptions we may have made about us, uh, mindfulness that have subsequently been proved not to be the case. Well, I think that um, in some ways, particularly in the business world, mindfulness is overhyped. That is, that the claims made go beyond what the research actually shows. And uh, when I reviewed the findings, those are the ones that have held up most strongly. I don't know what those claims are, nor do I want to point fingers, but uh, I know that there are many uh, results of mindfulness that are sold, which actually are not well supported by research so far. Um, yes, so let's take the question there, and I, and I promise to go up to the lady at the back. Thanks, Jay. So I'm not really sure how to compose this, but so I was just wondering what your opinion is on the overlap between mental health, um, spirituality, and mindfulness, and whether people presenting with a mental health condition such as bipolar um, might be experiencing something which is an alt some sort of altered state of consciousness, uh, which perhaps is also accessible through mindfulness. Well, I didn't hear the part about the bipolar. Could you say that again? Uh, whether people who are exhibiting something like a, like bipolar, oh, bipolar and in a manic phase are right. actually right. perhaps also accessing perhaps uh, aspects of mindfulness oh, in one regard. See. Yeah. So a manic phase can be feeling very energetic and happy or very angry, actually, too. Uh, it isn't, doesn't necessarily look like mindfulness. But I think the general relationship between mindfulness well-being and mental health is positive correlation, uh, except when you come to biologically based disorders like autism, like schizophrenia, or like bipolar disorder. Uh, and then uh, a different dynamic is at work. And there was just one other angle in the question about whether there's a link to spirituality there, Dan, as well. Whether, Spiritual, oh, yeah, spirituality. So, so whether there's any kind of connection between mental well-being or indeed mental yeah. ill-being and whether that's related yeah. to spiritual... So I, I would say that spirituality, the sense of mystery and, and uh, larger meaning in the universe is also positively correlated with well-being. Uh, mindfulness may or may not be connected with that. Mindfulness is taught here in the West in a very secular fashion. In the East it's taught within a spiritual context. But... Um, I see. I, I experienced the very revelatory moments. Oh, I see. When I was in a manic state, and it, and it did feel like this yeah. um, of, observation of, of oneness and universe, universal reality. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So so that's the positive side of the manic episode is you can have transcendental experiences. Um, it's not always that way for everybody, and I'm not sure. I would say this. I would say there's some overlap between the uh, kind of ecstatic states that you can get, say, on a retreat or advanced meditators sometimes experience uh, and some of the uh, ecstasy, perhaps, of a bipolar state, a very extremely positive bipolar state. And the reason, I'm sure, is biochemical. I just don't know the basis. So thank you for that question and for sharing that. It's very interesting, and, th and thank you, Dan, for that response. Um, so I promise to take the lady's question at the back and then I'm going to switch attention to this side of the room for a moment. So. Thank you very much for an amazing lecture this evening. My interest is basically in memory training oh. and my question is with regards to uh, people who suffer from minor uh, memory issue. I'm talking about short-term memory and Alzheimer's. Would... Um, mindfulness be appropriate and help in those particular situations. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, there, there's as yet no well-designed study that suggests directly that mindfulness training would help delay the onset of Alzheimer's symptoms. Alzheimer's symptoms are largely, again, biologically caused, you know, plaque in the brain and so on. 
uh, there is some sign, and I mentioned one, that mindfulness enhances working memory. In other words, it would, it, and if that were true, and if you could bring that to pre-Alzheimer's people, I would suspect it would slow the onset. Yeah. So let's switch over to this side. I just saw this man, gentleman with the blue jacket on with his hand up, and then I'll, I'll take one over there with you, Jake, as well. Thank you. Mine was just a comment to help the person from who asked about corporations, is that Richard and Tessa have created in Parliament an all-party parliamentary group on mindfulness, and 150 MPs and Lords and 250 staff there have done an eight-week course on mindfulness, and it makes a difference in terms of the interaction in that place. So I just thought you should know. Wonderful. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Please, go ahead. Me? Yeah, um, you can hear me. So I think I've got two questions, if that's all right. Sure. Um, the first one is about taking mindfulness, and mindfulness as I know it is about being present in the moment, being aware of your senses in a non-judgmental way, and, and often it you know, connects nature as well. So bringing that um, awareness, to that presence to your experience. So obviously, as you were saying, it really gets you away from those thoughts which are fleeting yeah. all over the place yeah, about the future, right. about the past, etc. But connecting it to your work, you know, about um, emotional intelligence, um, there seems to be an opportunity there that has been missed to take it one step further and just be aware of the emotions that are present in that moment. So I suppose it's a bit of a comment. It's also a question, see what you would yeah. say in response to that. Right. So... I wrote a book called Focus, which says, hey, you know what? I didn't realize it because I never thought of it, but attention and mindfulness is interwoven with emotional intelligence. The first component of emotional intelligence is self-awareness. Well, mindfulness is nothing but enhancing self-awareness, awareness of thoughts, awareness of feelings. So I think the two go hand in hand. In fact, I told that to an audience of 500 business people this morning in London. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. Second question. Yeah. The, the second question is about mindfulness and transcendental meditation. Uh -huh. uh, I, I practice TM for sure mm -hmm. and um, have done for, for a number of years and find great benefits from it. Sure. And I, I think mind, for me, the way I see mindfulness is it's coming at, it, it's um, a very fashionable thing. So people engage in it and it's popular and it's doing a lot of good in the world. Um, but it seems that TM has a lot more research into it and can actually take us to the next level. So I don't know if you have any experience with TM or how you relate it yeah, to Yeah, I actually went to a TM teacher's training course. I did TM for several years before I went to India. And then I wrote a book, which I'm a little embarrassed by now, called The Meditative Mind. I'm embarrassed because I didn't know what I didn't know. Uh, hmm. But I, uh, I think TM is a very powerful technique. Uh, and... The research um, that we review, however, was light on TM because many studies of meditation, including many of TM, uh, fail to have what's called an active control group. An active control group means someone who is just as positive and enthusiastic about a method which they practice for just as much time, but which does not influence attention, mindfulness, or uh, concentration. TM. As I remember, you start your mantra, and then your mind wanders, you gently start the mantra again. Is that, uh, does that ring a bell with you? Uh, yeah, you, you allow yourself to come back. As you were saying, with the mindfulness exercise, you just allow yourself to come back to the yeah. mantra. So, so in, in a sense, it's a functional equivalent, from my way of thinking, to mindfulness, although we could have a longer discussion about that. Yeah. But I think that uh, TM, like most meditation methods, uh, it has very positive benefits. I suspect that the benefits differ slightly from meditation to meditation. So it may be that the benefits of TM, when they're well-researched, turn out to be a little different, but maybe overlapping with those of mindfulness. And then the advanced level uh, we deal with on our, in the book, too. Which, just to remind you, is called The Science of Meditation and can be ordered now on Amazon. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. 
Um, we did promise to wrap this uh, event up at half past eight. We are I'm going to take one, one more question at least. And I have, uh, would like us to do this lovely sort of wrap-up around ways we can take this forward. Um, so please do stick around for that, because there's also something rather exciting to announce as well. But I, I wanted to just sort of get a sense of who's in the room on these two topics. So who here has got some form of mindfulness practice, does some kind of meditation, some kind of awareness focus? I mean, that's a tremendous percentage. Um, so th thank you for that. And then who here would say that they're also passionate about contributing to a happier world and this idea of social action and wanting to build a better world. So we've got the, the perfect audience here, Dan, in terms of this, these two themes. So thank you for thank you very addressing much. both of those so much. Can we... Oh, okay.